Fill my cup, Lord. I, I lift it up, Lord. Come in, quench that's thirsting of my soul. Breath. up and make me whole Good evening, everyone. Welcome to Peyton Tabernacle Church of God in Christ, our midweek service, also known as Soul Food Thursday. Be refreshed, be renewed, be revived, be rejuvenated. I pray that you have had a blessed day in the Lord, and I am excited to hear what thus says the Lord through our pastor, the elder Charles P. Aiken Sr. Just wanted to remind you all of what our mission is here at Peyton Tabernacle. And our mission is that we have been chosen and sent by God to repair the spiritual condition of men preaching Christ Jesus, rebuild the family unit by teaching love and righteousness and restore godly communities and their relationships with God through obedience to his word. And our prayer is that this changes the world in which we live. One person, one family, and one community at a time. Before we go any further into the service, we are going to have our prayer and our scripture reading. Good evening. Good evening. Hi, my name is Charles Peyton Akins Jr. Please bow your heads. Thank you for this day. Thank you for everything we have. Bless the people who will hopefully turn and strengthen them and make them Holy Spirit filled. And we pray that your Holy Spirit will be upon us and with us. In Jesus' name, we pray. Amen. So today I'm going to be reading. Um, Second Chronicles 7 verses 12 through 15, King James Version. And the Lord appeared to Solomon by night and said unto him, I have heard thy prayer and have chosen this place to myself for an house of sacrifice. If I shut up heaven that there be no rain, or if I command the locusts to devour the land, or if I send pestilence among my people, if my people, which are called by my name, shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then will I hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and will heal their land. No mine eyes shall be open and my ears attend unto the prayer that is made in this place. The word of God is blessed. Amen. Amen. We truly thank God for his word. Now it's time to get your spiritual utensils ready, your forks, your knives, your spoons, your bowls, your plates, what have you. Get it ready and be prepared to hear 
what thus says the Lord, the word of God on tonight through our pastor, the elder Charles P. Aikens Sr. We will now have him at this time. Good evening, good evening. Welcome, saints, family, friends. Uh, one of my teachers used to say germs, guys and germs, just being funny. Um, welcome everybody uh, to another Soul Food Thursday. We hope and pray that uh, if your week has, in fact, been a tough one, if you find yourself a little bit tired, sluggish, uh, you're troubled with moving forward just a little bit, then we hope that tonight's message will provide you with a little bit of oomph, a little bit of energy. We hope that this Soul Food Thursday will feed your soul such that you have enough strength to go on through the weekend, all right? We are hoping that everyone is um, here, focused, and ready to receive of the word of God, and we are ready to deliver, all right? So, good evening. Good evening, Sister Donna. God bless you. Welcome. Everyone, if you will go with me to the Lord in prayer, we're going to bow our heads, and then we're going to get right into the message, all right? No playing. Now, most gracious and most eternal Heavenly Father, in the name of Jesus, we give you the, God, the glory, the honor, and the praise, dear God, for once again allowing us another opportunity to study your word. Father, we come to you. We come to your word. We seek your throne for strength, for joy, for peace, for correction, for guidance, for our love, our comfort, our understanding. And we pray that your Holy Spirit have its own way, his own way, that you have your own way, that lives are changed, hearts are mended, souls are healed and delivered in the name of Jesus. Now, God, we pray that you take me out of this equation, dear God. You place yourself in the forefront where you belong. Allow me to take the back seat. Use me as you see fit and speak a word into the lives of these, your people. In Jesus' name, we pray and we thank you in advance. Amen. Amen and amen. All right, saints. So tonight's message is about obedience. Obedience. And it's gonna, I don't, I don't think that it's a new approach, but it, it is a um probably not a frequently used approach. So we are going to be coming from the book of Deuteronomy, the 28th chapter. We're gonna read the first and second verses there. We're going to read again 2 Chronicles 7, 12 through 15, which my son already read. And I may not read just because he already read that. If my people who are called by my name would humble themselves and pray. Um, we're going to read Joel, the second chapter, the 12th through the 32nd verses, which is long. And then we're going to read Jeremiah 18, 6 through 11. All right. All of this we'll be reading from the King James Version. And the word of God reads as thus, and it came to pass, I'm sorry, and it shall, it shall come to pass if thou shalt hearken diligently unto the voice of the Lord thy God to observe and to do all his commandments, which I command thee this day, that the Lord thy God will set thee on high above all nations of the earth, and all these blessings shall come on thee and overtake thee, if Thou shalt hearken unto the voice of the Lord thy God. Now, we all know the uh, blessings that were stated in Deuteronomy 28. Uh, you'll be blessed in the city, blessed in the field, blessed when you come, blessed when you go. The key here is, if thou shalt hearken diligently unto the voice of the Lord thy God to observe and to do all his commandments. Uh, the same uh, applies for the second book of uh, second chronicles, the seventh book, I'm sorry, seventh chapter. Um, the, the focus of this chapter is if my people who are called by my name shall humble themselves and pray, seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then will I hear from heaven, I will forgive their sins, and I will heal their land. Joel. We're going to be in the second chapter, the 12th to the uh, 32nd verses, and I may not read all of it, but we'll do the start of it. Therefore, also now, saith the Lord, turn ye even to me with all your heart, 
and with fasting and with weeping and with mourning and rend your heart and not your garments. Tear your heart. Humble yourself. Belittle yourself. All right? Not your garment. It doesn't... The, the, one of their um, old... Um, uh, what do I call it? Traditions was to tear their garments when they were repenting. And you know, if you didn't tear the garment of your heart, then you're just doing the rest of it for the, the look of it. And God's not impressed. I mean, he's God for crying out loud. You, it's, it's not like it means anything to him. He knows if you're earnest. So you're wasting your time. All right, you put these shows on for people, but God doesn't want shows. He wants a contrite heart. And turn unto the Lord your God, for he is gracious and merciful, slow to anger and of great kindness, and repenteth him of the evil. Who knoweth if he will return and repent and leave a blessing behind him, even a meat offering and a drink offering unto the Lord your God. Blow the trumpet in Zion, sanctify a fast, Call a solemn assembly, gather the people, sanctify the congregation, assemble the elders, gather the children and those that suck the breasts. Let the bridegroom go forth of his chamber and his bride out of her closet. Let the priests, the ministers of the Lord, weep between the porch and the altar. Let them say, spare thy people, O Lord, and give not thine heritage to reproach, that the heathen should rule over them, wherefore should they say among the people, where is their God? Then will the Lord be jealous for his land and pity his people. Yea, the Lord will answer and say unto his people, behold, I will send you corn and wine and oil, and ye shall be satisfied therewith, and I will no more make you a reproach among the heathen. But I will remove far off from you the northern army and will drive him into a land barren and desolate with his face toward the East Sea and his hinder part toward the uttermost sea and his stink shall come up and his ill savor shall come up because he hath done great things. Fear not, O land, be glad and rejoice, for the Lord will be great, will do great things. Be not afraid, ye beasts of the field, for the pastures of the wilderness do spring. For the tree beareth her fruit, the fig tree and the vine do yield their strength. Be glad then, ye children of Zion, and rejoice in the Lord your God, for he hath given you the former rain moderately. And he will cause to come down for you the rain, the former rain, and the latter rain in the first month. And the floors shall be full of wheat, and the vats shall overflow with wine and oil. And I will restore to you the years that the locust hath eaten. The canker worm, and the caterpillar, and the palmer worm, and my great army, which I sent among you and ye shall eat in plenty and be satisfied and praise the name of the Lord your God that hath dealt wondrously with you and my people shall never be ashamed. And ye shall know that I am in the midst of Israel and that I am the Lord your God and none else and my people shall never be ashamed. And it shall come to pass afterward that I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh and your sons and daughters shall prophesy and your old men shall dream dreams. Your young men shall see visions and also the servants and upon the handmaids in those days will I pour out my spirit and I will shew wonders in the heavens and in the earth, blood and fire and pillars of smoke. The sun shall be turned into darkness and the moon into blood before the great and terrible day of the Lord come. And it shall come to pass that whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be delivered 
For in Mount Zion and in Jerusalem shall be deliverance, as the Lord hath said, and in the remnant whom the Lord shall call. O house of Israel, cannot I do as this potter, saith the Lord. Behold, as the clay is in the potter's hand, so are ye in mine hand, O house of Israel. At what instant I shall speak concerning a nation and concerning a kingdom to pluck up and to pull down and to destroy it. If the nation against whom I pronounced turn from their evil, I will repent of the evil that I thought to do unto them. And at what instant I shall speak concerning a nation and concerning a kingdom to build and to plant it, if it do evil in my sight, that it obey not my voice, then I will repent of the good wherewith I said I would benefit them. Now, therefore, go to speak to the men of Judah and to the inhabitants of Jerusalem, saying, Thus saith the Lord, Behold, I frame evil against you and devise a device against you. Return ye now every one from his evil way and make your ways and your doings good. Amen. The word of the Lord is indeed blessed. Now, saints, I have been struggling a little bit. I believe my allergies are becoming a problem because I've spent the last, uh, well, a few days out in the in the, the uh, air, and my throat is struggling something horrible. So uh, y'all pray for me. Pray for me. So we're going to talk about obedience tonight. Oh, Obedience. Now we see from the scriptures, from the text that we've already read, God has distinct plans for his children, for his people. God has distinct desires for his people. We oftentimes interfere with the plans, the desires that God has because we don't obey. So tonight, we're going to look at obedience from a little different perspective. You know, generally, you talk about if God is your God, if you say you are his, if you say you have faith, then you obey, then you do it. But tonight, we're going to talk about the other side, what God actually intends. And we've seen through all these scriptures, they are laden with blessings that God wants to give his people. The problem is us not him. We oftentimes, we go to preachers, right? And I, I don't understand what's going on. I prayed, I asked the Lord to do this. I asked the Lord to do that. And sometimes a preacher will ask, well, what have you done that the Lord told you to do? What are you doing in terms, sit up and stop playing. What are you doing in terms of your relationship? Don't start. Do not start. You hear me? What are you doing in terms of your relationship? And what you're supposed to be doing? Take that. Go out. And go get tissue. You better not do that again. Are you in prayer? Are you fasting? Are you meditating on the word? Are you trying to hear from God? Are you trying to listen to the will of God concerning your life? Or are you simply placing petitions before God repeatedly? See, look at the scriptures. Every one of the scriptures said, if you repent, if you seek God, if you turn from evil and you obey, you do what he commands, then he'll bless you, he'll protect you, he'll provide for you, right? He'll bring you peace. There's conditions. Obedience to God is really all about relationship. And then, because of relationship, 
It becomes about protection, provision, and blessings. I say this oftentimes, and I like to leave this with people. I, would, I like for people to think of it this way because it reminds us that God has so much more information than we do. God is like a maze creator. He creates this great maze, life, and he places us in it. And then he tries to direct those that will listen because he already knows what's coming. So in our sense, in our finite sense, we imagine God looking down at our life. And before, see, God lives outside of time. We live within time. So because God is who he is, God can already see what you're going to do, where you're going to go, what you're going to run into, who you're going to deal with, who you're going to need, who you're going to need to stay away from. God can see all these things already. So in our mind, in our sense, we imagine God as a maze creator looking down because it's unfathomable for most of us, unfathomable for us to envision God being and then seeing ahead before anything ever happens. But he's infinite. So he knew what you were going to do before you did it. He knew who you were going to be before you were born. So your actions and reactions don't catch God by surprise. And neither does your future. He knows when you're going to disobey him. He knows when your heart's going to get broken or you're going to be put in a dangerous situation and you're going to almost die. And he knows all of this stuff. He knows the choices you're going to make. And that's why he sends guidance. So because God knows the future, he knows all the bad decisions we will and won't make. He knows about that person that's going to come into your life and who is going to do you bodily harm, who is going to abuse you physically and mentally. He knows about the person who's going to cheat on you. He knows about the job where the active shooter is going to come on the campus and attack. He knows about the person who will love you with all their heart. True devotion and godliness. And as well, he knows about the job that's going to lead to the huge promotion. So he tries to steer us in the direction of those things that are going to be beneficial to us and not harmful. He simply asks us to be obedient. Mm -hmm. And when you think about it, when God already knows how things are going to work out for us, if we say we love God and we trust God and we believe that he is omnipotent, omniscient, and omnipresent, then how much more um, disheartening, disrespectful is it of us to not follow him? Because you say you know he's God, he's all powerful, and all you say that you know these things. So then if you know these things about God and, and you choose not to listen to him, you choose to disobey his will for your life, then what are you saying? What are we saying? That's something for us to think about. So God knows all of these things. And he sometimes, um, <laughs> because of because of some of us in the way we are, some of sometimes his efforts are a waste of time. But because God loves us, he keeps after us, even though he knows it's a waste of time. God knows most people are going to hell. But Jesus died anyway. God knew the disciples were going to turn their backs on Jesus. But he died anyway. Jesus knew it. See, everybody always thinks about him in the Garden of Gethsemane, and they think... 
of him praying and, and, and crying and bleeding sweat. And they think that Jesus was afraid. He's God. He wasn't afraid for that body to be destroyed. He didn't look forward to being separated from God for people who would betray him, who would spit on him, who would turn their backs, who would lie, who would betray him at an instant, who, who would turn him over to be murdered, and then who would murder his name and his, his deeds over and over again in the future. God is righteous, perfect. He had to become sin in order to fulfill the necessary payment for our sin. So he had to be separated from righteousness for the moment to take up that mantle for us, for people the majority of whom would reject him anyway, who would kill him, lie on him, deny him, but he did it anyway. And all he asks is that we're obedient, that we trust him. God wants to protect us from harm, from disappointments, from hurt, from pain. God also desires to provide for his children above and beyond their expectations. You, 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 you heard the scriptures I read. God wants to do many faceted things, wonderful blessings he wants to place in our lives. But because he is perfect, our obedience is paramount because our obedience unlocks all the potential for blessings that are in that lies in our lives. But because he's perfect, imperfection puts a lock on that. God can't lie. And he cannot reward evil with good. So when we are disobedient, when we are sinful, when we are hate-filled, when we lie and cheat, commit adultery, fornication, when we do these things, we separate ourselves from God. Obedience. God seeks to develop us into people that he can bless without the thought due to our desire and, and desire to be obedient and our responsiveness in a positive fashion to his will. Let me say that again, be a little easier. God seeks to develop us into people that he can bless without thought due to our desire to respond positively to his will. Satan, however, wants to convince us that God's way is an obstacle to our fun, to our satisfaction, to our pleasure, to our desires. Once you view obedience as an obstacle, you begin then to reject God's guidance, his protection, his provisions, and his blessings. But remember, as a maze creator, God knows what will befall all of us. And with that in mind, following God's guidance not only gives us the greatest of protection, excuse me, excuse me, but it also presents us with the highest upside as far as our life is concerned and what we deem success. Our obedience unties God's hands. It frees God when it comes to blessing us. Now, in the alphabet, O comes before P, right? A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H, I, J, K, L, M, L, P, right? O, P. Well, just like O precedes P in the alphabet, obedience must precede our protection, our provisions, and God's plans. See how that works? First, 
you find yourself obedient to the will of God, then you automatically put into action God's plans, protection, and, and, and his provisions for you. But you can't get P, get to P without going through O. Neither can we get to the protection, the plans, and the pro and the and the provisions before being obedient. Without obedience, we cannot follow the path which protects us from hurt, harm, danger, pain, or loss. Neither can we follow a pathway which leads us to the provisions and plans without first being obedient. It is your obedience, your will, your willingness to listen, your desire to follow God's guidance that will take you to the pathway you need to take in order to arrive there. So it is impossible just like it's impossible to get to up P before you go through O, it is impossible to get to God's protection and provision without obedience. Satan <clears throat> always seeks to twist God's words in order to harm us, right? Look at the, the um, I could go through a, a thousand different issues, but the most prevalent is right in the beginning. Adam and Eve lie and confuse the word to get people into a prideful mode and have them to jump against the word of God, twist the word around. Then he tried it with Jesus. <laughs> but that shows you, Satan didn't know who Jesus was. He was trying to figure out who Jesus was. He, he, Satan's not going to present the word of God to the word of God, right? He's not that crazy. But he didn't know who Jesus was, and I won't get into all that. So he presents the word of God, but he takes it out of context. So Jesus throws the word back at him in the correct context. And then, of course, Satan has to be quiet. Satan then becomes the catalyst for the removal of one's protection and nullifies God's provisions and blessings through our disobedience to God and willingness to listen to and follow him, Satan. Remember, God is a God of covenant relationship. He's also bound by truth and righteousness. If he calls for righteousness and obedience as a requirement to blessings, to receive blessings, provision and protection, so must we operate within those parameters to keep the covenant ratified. You look at any situation in the Bible, if you want to see what I'm talking about, look at all of the people in the Bible who had special relationships with God and the things he did for them. I love talking about Hezekiah because Hezekiah's day had come. He was about to punch the clock. His ticket was his, his ticket was up. And this dude had such a relationship with God that he turned to the wall and begged and pleaded and cried. And God allowed him to live 15 more years. The prophet was coming to tell him, hey, dude, your time, it's your time. You got to go. You got to leave this place. He told him, you are checking out but because he had a relationship with God, because he sought God, he believed, he trusted God. God gave him what he asked for. Uh, let's see. David, the only thing that um, I guess you could say God didn't, because God, 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 well, there are a couple of things actually that God didn't grant for David, but David's life is shrouded with protection from God, from uh, the battle with Goliath to the thousands of men he killed, which was also the reason God wouldn't allow him to build the temple, which was one of the requests he made with God. But God wouldn't let him do it because he had blood on his hands. Nonetheless, there are, there are so many different things that he did for him. Um, Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, there are all kinds of people in the Bible 
who were obedient to God. They had a strong relationship filled with obedience. And because of that obedience, because of that relationship, God honored the things that they requested. So God's expectation is that we do our part, that we simply obey, we be obedient. And as we humble ourselves before God, as we listen, as we follow his guidance, that frees God to be more than fair in providing for all of those who are obedient to him, who, who live according to their covenant. Satan works out of order, or he works to disrupt the necessary sequence, right? Satan's referred to as the accuser of the brethren, author of confusion, father of lies, and God is the God of order. So either Satan will jumble things up in, pers in a person's mind or in their lives, or he'll convince you. Ah, you don't have to take it that far. I just told you, you must go from O, the letter O, to the letter P, right? So you must start with obedience in order to ratify the covenant that provides you the protection, the provisions, the plans of God, the blessings, right? But Satan will tell you, yeah, y'all, young, mm -hmm. you all know the the old saying: it don't take all that. Yeah, you, you ain't you ain't gotta do all that. It, it, it that's not necessary. So he tries to convince you that you can, instead of going from the obedience to God's protection by following God's voice, he tries to convince you that you can stop at N, right? <laughs> not necessary. <laughs> you don't even have to go through O. You can go to N, and N is good enough. And when you get to N. All you have to do, right, and, 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 and that, that how does that look? That looks like um, if you confess the Lord Jesus, he is Lord, then you're good to go. That's all you got to do. And you all know there's a saying from the Baptist church, once saved, always saved, right? Right. That's going to end. Well, you don't have to obey God. You just have to say that he is Lord. And he is savior over your life. And you repent. And that's all you got to do. And then after that, you can keep sinning. But as long as you said it, you're good. That's satanic. God said, if my people who are called by my name would humble themselves and pray, seek my face and turn from their wicked ways. Turn from means repent right? Do a 180 degree turn and go in the other direction. Not continue to sin, but stop. That's a contradiction. So that once saved, always saved, you can stop at N. If, as long as you say he's my Lord and Savior, you're good. It is a lie. And that scripture in and of itself and every scripture, in fact, that I've read for you this evening tells you that is a lie from the pit of hell, that obedience is in fact required in order to ratify the contract. God makes the contract with us, but it is not ratified unless we are obedient. Satan can convince you that your obedience isn't required. Then you will not receive the protection, provisions, and plans of God. And you can also forfeit all of those things for good, right? Everything that God has set aside specifically, both to meet your needs and to bring peace, love, joy, and fulfillment into your life can be removed at an instant because you choose to be disobedient. Don't let Satan trick you. Don't let Satan convince you that in is far enough. The Bible says our righteousness is as whole or, or filthy rags. 
your righteousness. The best that we can do isn't good enough. So in isn't going to get it. Grace and mercy covers those whose hearts and minds are bent on serving God and being obedient to him. For those who desire to do according to God's will, grace and mercy covers them. But you must, deep down inside, really want to serve God. If deep down inside you're putting on a show and you intend to go back and do whatever when you get a chance, then God knows that. Once, I want to use a metaphor, once you are out from under the umbrella of God's protection, then the rainfall comes. And that's when the showers of issues will present themselves in your lives. Example, anger and rage. One way that Satan can accomplish his mission is through anger and rage. Now, why do I say that? Because anger and rage are very powerful disruptors, all right? Anger forces you to focus on a person, a situation, circumstance, rather than God. It causes you to become more enraged the more you focus on it. So you ever ever hear something from somebody and then you, you stop talking to them and you walk away? And, and somebody tells you somebody did such and such or said such and such about you. And then you walk away and you start stewing on that thing. You start, you, you let it marinate. And then you start thinking about your relationship to that person, whether they know you or not. If you did a bunch of things for them, if you helped them a lot and then they turned around and did this dirty thing or they don't know you from a can of paint and they have the nerve to run their mouth about you and then you start thinking and boy, the more you think about it, the hotter your head gets. You get to the point where they could fry an egg and a piece of steak on your head because you're so hot. At that point, you're not thinking about what God wants. You're not thinking about the way God wants things. Okay? So anger, it forces you to focus on the circumstance or the person too much. This process then disrupts or clouds your judgment, your clarity, your decision-making, your hearing, and your insight. They all become oblivious because all you can think about is that thing that you are enraged with. Now, once this occurs, you switch to autopilot. You stop you lose the ability to hold yourself accountable for anything. Your accountability receptors are blocked, shut down completely by blind rage. Or it's, sometimes it's not rage, it's lust, right? Somebody put the wrong thing in your head. You start thinking about that thing and you start lusting either after a person, or a, 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 a car, a job, whatever. When you start thinking about all the things you're going to do with it. Oh, what I would be able to do if I had them. What I would do to them. What I would do with it. Your mind goes on autopilot. And the Lord, when you read um, Isaiah, I believe it was. Was it Isaiah that the Lord was, was talking to? No, Elijah. And, and he wasn't in the... He wasn't in the wind. He wasn't in the earthquake. He wasn't in the fire. It was a small, still voice. And when your mind is completely discombobulated as such, when you are so enthralled in this thing, you can't hear that small, still voice talking to you. You can't receive any direction from God. Does, does this sound familiar to anybody? Has anybody ever been in that situation? You just allowed something to completely encapsulate your mind. And the next thing you know, you've gone off on a planet somewhere. You can no longer, can you nor wish to, or I'm sorry, you no longer can nor wish to process thoughts, except for those thoughts that are related to the instant gratification 
surrounding the issue. All you can see or hear is that which you believe will make you feel better about what has happened to you or what you've heard or what you've seen. Satan and his minions then remind you, after you partake, after you go in, after you dive, after you lose it, and then you wake up, Satan and his minions then remind you, you failed to be obedient to God. You don't love God. You are a liar. You are disobedient. You are a wretch. You are worthless. You are scum. Why would God want you? God said, sin stinks to his nostrils. So you stink to God. They utterly browbeat you with condemnation after they were the ones who convinced you to go after whatever it was. Now all you can hear is, now God won't help you because you're disobedient. You don't listen. The Holy Spirit has taken flight. They don't want to be bothered with you. You don't deserve God's help. You don't deserve his love. You don't deserve his protection because you're never going to obey him. You can't shake that thing. You're stuck with it. It's a, it is a generational curse. It's a stronghold and you can't defeat it. Every time it pops up, you go right back after it. You're worthless. You've got to hear all of this because you didn't stay focused because you weren't obedient. Even though it was the enemy who convinced you in the first place, to disobey God or not to get as close to God as you need to because that's far enough, they will stop at nothing until you feel totally unworthy of God's love and protection, until they drive you to a place of sin and shame and guilt where you seek utter darkness to hide yourself from the face of God, from others, and even from yourself. It is in this place of shame and embarrassment and regret that he works to destroy your hope in a relationship with God. This is the place he gets you, where he convinces you, you will never change. There is no hope. God doesn't want you. God can't use you. You're worthless. You can't even get rid of this. You can't stop doing this simple thing. You're useless to God. And when you separate yourself from people, when you separate yourself from God, when you decide to be disobedient and you start to feel that shame, now you block out the Holy Spirit. Again, just like the lust and the anger causes that, 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 cl that cloud in your mind, so does guilt and shame. All sin and its results have the same response. They cause the same response. They become louder than the voice of God and everything around, they take your, draw your attention away from what you need to pay attention to. And they make you, they force you to focus on the thing. In other words, God desires to have a special relationship with each of his children. All relationships require parameters of dependency, love, trust, and truth, among other things. When we love God, we enter into a relationship or covenant with him. In that covenant relationship, we decide to trust God, to have faith in him. We decide that we will obey God. We decide that we will change so that God's purpose can manifest itself within us. God then honors his promise to provide. 
God also honors his promise to protect, to bless, and to comfort. Isaiah 26 and 3 says, Thou wilt keep him in perfect peace, whose mind is stayed on thee, because he trusteth in thee. See, saints, if we keep our mind focused on God, if we spend our time thinking about the promises of God instead of what our situations look like, if we devote our focus to the mighty works of God, past and present in our lives and in the lives of all the other people we know, and stop focusing on other people who talk about us. If we remember the power of the one true living God, the God that spoke and light was separated from darkness, that God, and stop thinking about some job we work on where somebody is giving us trouble. If we can focus on the faithfulness of God. Saints, remember, you have not been faithful always, but God has. Even when you failed, God did not fail you. When you gave up, God didn't give in. You are here today because God continues to overshadow your life with grace and mercy. You're not perfect. I'm definitely not perfect. But I recall to my mind the faithfulness of God, even in my times of imperfection, that he continues to keep me, that he presents me with yet another opportunity to repent, to go before his face, to apologize, to seek him the more, to grow closer to him, to learn more about him, and to become more like him. If we remember our dependency upon God, in him we live, in him we move, and in him we have our being, we cannot think walk, act, or breathe without the help of God. And if we focus on these things, if we remember these things, if we recall these things to our mind instead of the negative things that we see all around us, if we just remember all I need to do is be obedient and God will give me the fat of the land. God will provide. God will protect. He already has plans set aside for me. I just need to obey him. And to obey him, I need to focus on hearing from him. Then we'll seek the face of God and we'll seek the help of God. And when we do that, When our life consists of waking up every morning, knowing that we live in him, we live and in him, we move and in him, we have our being. If our life consists every morning of acknowledging this before we even start it, God, I need you with me. First of all, thank you for the breath in my body. Thank you for the blood running warm through my veins. Thank you for the cognizance to be able to seek you. And then, God, I want to say that besides the obvious things, I need you just to act, just to speak, just to walk, just to talk, just to eat, to breathe, to see, to hear, to touch. I need you. So I'm asking you, the one who covers me in all things, be with me, direct me. 
comfort me. Give me that peace that Jesus promised he left with the Holy Spirit. Help me to remain focused on you no matter what I'm doing. Be my eyes and ears. Be my conscience. Be my guide. If we do this every day, if we focus on this every day, Satan will have a hard time throwing us off. And when he does try to throw us off, you know what? Then the word of God will start coming back to us. No weapon that is formed against thee shall prosper. And every tongue that shall rise against thee in judgment, thou shalt condemn. For this is the heritage of the servants of the Lord, and their righteousness is of me. Thus saith the Lord. I know the thoughts that I think toward you, thoughts of good and not of evil. To bring you an expected end, a hope and a purpose. But I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Greater is he who is within me than he who is within the world. Ye are of God little children, and have overcome them. For greater is he who is within you than he who is within the world. If we remember these things, and remember Jesus said, I will do anything you ask in my name. But you've got to believe, right? What things soever ye desire when ye pray, First, believe you're going to receive them and you shall have them. We've got to trust God, saints. I'm sorry. We've got to trust God. As we devote our focus to the things of God, we are on a high alert against the enemy. We naturally look for and see Satan at work and trying to hinder or stop our progress. We are ready, aware, and expecting battle. Contrary to popular opinion, saints, God's objective is not to stop you from having fun. Rather, God's objective is instead to bless, protect, and provide for, and to save you from any regret. I hope that you all enjoyed the uh, message this evening. I pray that it was a blessing to you. We're going to go to the Lord in prayer to seal the word, and then we will give the benediction. Now, most gracious and eternal Heavenly Father, in the name of Jesus, God, the God of provision, of protection, of plans, the God of blessings, the God of love, the God of peace and joy, of strength and comfort, we thank you, dear Lord. We thank you for your word. We thank you for leaving your word with us, reminding us that if we just obey, if we trust you, Lord, if we stand on your word, if we stand on your will, if we allow you to guide us, we shall indeed eat the fat of the land. Now, Father, it is my prayer that every person who is under the sound of my voice would heed to this call, that they would if they have not already, begin to trust you and obey you. If they are, that they would do it further with more fervor, dear God, with more resilience, with more strength, with more trust, with more faith, that we would all walk away this evening endowed with more faith, with more trust. God bless us. Touch our hearts. Allow your word to in, let it be encapsulated within us. Plant it within our hearts, dear God, and allow it to germinate, to grow, and let that seed bring forth good fruit in its time. Now, God, we pray that all these things be done in Jesus' holy name, and we thank you in advance. Amen. All right, saints. We thank you once again for attending. We thank you, and we pray that you receive something this evening. Now we're going to give the benediction and we'll say, we pray that all is well with you. Have a wonderful evening and a wonderful weekend. And now may the grace of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ 
and the sweet communion of his Holy Spirit rest, rule, and may it abide with us all henceforth and forever. Until we meet again, God bless you. God be with you. Amen. Amen. And amen. Say goodbye. Bye. Thank you.